The Space Trouble Orbital has what is likely the hardest mission to accomplish after spending seven days in orbit around the Earth. It must speed through the atmosphere to create a layer of superheated plasma that surrounds the craft as it travels at a speed that would surpass a mocha. The space problem really turned into a unique spacecraft during re-entry. This area challenges its novel concept. This area craft thoughtfully weighs the requirements of the exposed vehicle. In today's video, we'll uncover the fantastical story of re-entry's crazy engineering, complete with gravitational acceleration and atmospheric contact. Stay with me through to the very end. It promises to be an amazing experience. When an item enters an atmosphere, it experiences two things. Aerodynamic heating, which is largely brought on by the air in front of the object compressing, as well as atmospheric drag, which causes mechanical stress on the object. Smaller things may experience full disintegration or loss of mass ablation due to these forces, while items with lower compressive strengths may burst. From 7.8 km per s for low Earth orbit, to about 12.5 km per s for the Stardust spacecraft, re-entry has been accomplished. Air brakes and parachute deployment are not possible until crewed spacecraft have decelerated to subsonic speeds. Since it is very impracticable to deploy retro rockets throughout the entire re-entry operation, atmospheric dissipation is the only means of increasing the high kinetic energy of such vehicles. Expendable vehicles and ballistic warheads are designed to remain fast during re-entry. In fact, they don't even need to slow down. Moreover, heat shielding is not necessary for slow speed returns to Earth from near space, such as high altitude parachute jumps from balloons, because an object's gravitational acceleration from within the atmosphere or just slightly above it cannot create enough velocity to significantly warm the atmosphere. Conventionally, the atmospheric entry on Earth takes place at the Kármán line, 100 km 62 km. 54 nautical miles above the surface. On Venus, it happens at 250 kilometers, 160 miles, 130 nmi. And on Mars, it happens at roughly 80 kilometers, 50 miles, 43 nmi. Uncontrolled objects accelerate through space toward Earth under the force of gravity, reaching great velocity. They are slowed by friction when they come into contact with Earth's atmosphere. Because of a distinct orbital route before they approach Earth's gravity well, meteors frequently travel at a very high speed about the planet. Due to their suborbital-like intercontinental ballistic missile re-entry vehicles, orbital like the Soyuz, or unbounded-like meteor trajectories, the majority of objects arrive at hypersonic speeds. Several cutting-edge technologies have been created to facilitate extremely fast flight and atmospheric re-entry. An alternate technique for managing atmospheric entry is buoyancy, which works well for planetary entry in situations when high-velocity hyperbolic entry is complicated by thick atmospheres, strong gravity, or both. Examples of these types of environments include the atmospheres of Venus, Titan, and the giant planets. In the case of meteors, which enter the atmosphere at speeds as high as 30 miles per second, 48 kilometers per second, the interior of the meteors remains cold, and the erosion is due, to a large extent, to chipping or cracking of the suddenly heated surface, Robert Goddard wrote in 1920, introducing the idea of the ablative heat shield. Because of this, the apparatus's outer surface would not erode significantly if it were made of layers of hard, infusible material with layers of a poor heat conductor sandwiched in between. This is especially true given that the apparatus's velocity would not be nearly as high as that of an ordinary meteor. Reaching an altitude of over 300,000 feet and traveling at a speed of over 4,500 miles per hour plus 7, 270 kilometers per h, the X-15 was able to reach the edge of space. Because there were worries about the re-entry from 400,000 feet, the highest altitude the rocket plane could theoretically reach, the target altitude for X-15 missions was set at 360,000 feet. A NASA B-52 mothership raised the aircraft to a launch height of 45,000 feet, after which it was airdropped to obtain sufficient fuel for the rocket plane to accomplish its high speed and altitude test points. The rocket engine propelled the aircraft for the first 80 to 120 seconds of flight, depending on the mission. 
The typical 10 to 11 minute ride finished with a 200 miles per hour glide landing and no power. Airdropped by a NASA B-52 mothership, the X-15 reached an altitude of over 300,000 feet and traveled at a speed of over 4,500 miles per hour, plus 7 270 kilometers per h. The X-15 was able to reach the edge of space. Because there were worries about the re-entry from 400,000 feet, the highest altitude the rocket plane could theoretically reach. The target altitude for X-15 missions was set at 360,000 feet. As ballistic missile range and re-entry velocity grew, practical development of re-entry systems started. Stabilization and aerodynamic stress were crucial for early short-range missiles like the V-2. Heating was not a major concern, but many V-2S broke apart on re-entry. With a 1-200 km-1, 200 nautical mile range, Medium-range missiles such as the Soviet R-5 required ceramic composite heat shielding on their detachable re-entry vehicles. The rocket system as a whole could no longer withstand re-entry. With ranges of 4,300, 6,500 NMI and 8,000, 12,000 kilometers, the first interplanetary ballistic missiles, ICBMs, were only made feasible by the advancement of blunt-shaped vehicles with contemporary ablative heat shields. H. Julian Allen and A.J. Eggers Jr. of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics NACA at the Ames Research Center invented this technology in the United States. They discovered the surprising fact that the best heat shield was a blunt shape with high drag in 1951. Allen and Eggers demonstrated using basic engineering concepts that an entry vehicle's heat load was inversely related to the drag coefficient. That is, the higher the drag, the lower the heat load. The air cushion created by the blunt re-entry vehicle serves as a force to push the heated shock layer and shock wave forward and away from the vehicle. The heat energy would remain in the shocked gas and just migrate around the vehicle before dissipating into the atmosphere, because the majority of the hot gases are no longer in direct contact with the vehicle. Entry, descent, and landing, or EDL, is the phase that includes atmospheric entry when it is a part of a spacecraft landing or recovery especially on a planetary body other than Earth. The term re-entry generally invariably refers to Earth entry when the atmospheric entrance returns to the same body from which the vehicle had taken off. The primary goal of a spacecraft's atmospheric entry design is to dissipate the energy of a hypersonic spacecraft as it enters an atmosphere, slowing down any passengers, cargo, and equipment so they land at zero velocity close to a designated destination on the surface while limiting stresses on the spacecraft and any passengers to manageable levels. 9. This can be achieved through the use of parachute technology, aerodynamic or propellant vehicle features, or a combination of these. The sphere or spherical section is the most basic axisymmetric shape. This can be a spherical section forebody with a converging conical afterbody, or it can be a full sphere. One can easily model the aerodynamics of a sphere or spherical portion analytically by employing Newtonian impact theory. Similarly, the Fay-Riddell equation can be used to precisely estimate the heat flux in the spherical portion. A spherical section's dynamic stability is more troublesome, but its static stability is guaranteed if the vehicle's center of mass is upstream from the center of curvature. Pure spheres don't rise at all. Nonetheless, a spherical section's minor aerodynamic lift from flying at an angle of attack gives it some cross-range capabilities and expands its entry corridor. Computational fluid dynamics was still in its infancy, and high-speed computers were not yet accessible in the late 1950s and early 1960s. The spherical section's geometry established the standard for cautious design because it was amenable to closed-form analysis. As a result, the spherical part served as the foundation for crude capsules during that period. The early Soviet Vostok and Voskhod capsules, as well as the Soviet Mars and Venera descent vehicles, were all equipped with pure spherical entrance vehicles. Apollo Command Module has a converging conical afterbody and a spherical section forebody heat shield. With a hypersonic trim angle of attack of 27 to 0 degree blunt end first, it executed a lifting entrance that resulted in an average LD lift-to-drag ratio of 0.368. By deviating from the vehicle's axis of symmetry, the resulting lift allowed for some degree of cross-range control. The lift force could be directed left or right by rolling the capsule along its longitudinal axis. 
The crude capsules of Soyuz Zond, Gemini, and Mercury are other instances of spherical section geometry. Even tiny amounts of lift enable trajectories that significantly reduce the peak g-force, from 8-9g for a fully ballistic trajectory slowed only by drag to 4-5g, to and also significantly lower the peak re-entry heat. Developed in 1955 by General Electric Corp., the MK-2 RV re-entry vehicle was the first American sphere cone aeroshell. The design of the MK-2 was based on the blunt body theory and employed a metallic heat shield as the basis for a radiatively cooled thermal protection system TPS. The many TPS varieties are discussed later in this article. The MK-2 was a weapon delivery system with serious flaws. Its lower ballistic coefficient caused it to linger in the upper atmosphere for too long, and it also left behind a stream of vaporized metal that made it extremely visible to radar. The MK-2 was excessively vulnerable to anti-ballistic missile ABM systems as a result of these flaws. As a result, General Electric created a different sphere cone RV than the MK-2. Because of their orbital, boundless, or suborbital intercontinental ballistic missile re-entry vehicles, the majority of objects arrive at hypersonic speeds. Several cutting-edge technologies have been created to facilitate extremely fast flight and atmospheric re-entry. An alternate technique for managing atmospheric entry is buoyancy, which works well for planetary entry in situations when high-velocity hyperbolic entry is complicated by thick atmospheres, strong gravity, or both. Examples of these types of environments include the atmospheres of Venus, Titan, and the giant planets. 10 to 40% of the mass of re-entering satellites may make it to Earth's surface. As of 2014, roughly one cataloged object was re-entered every day on average. The majority of objects that survive re-entry settle in one of the world's oceans because water makes up the majority of the Earth's surface. A person's lifetime risk of being struck by lightning and suffering injuries is approximately one in a trillion. If you enjoyed this video, kindly hit the subscribe and like button for more. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell, so you will be notified when we upload new videos. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.